It is now, therefore, time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When Ontario's credit rating agencies saw the 2018 budget, they gave a stark warning. The rating firm stated, quote, the fiscal plan set out by the Liberal government would harm the province's credit profile over the long term. Moody said, quote, the planned return to deficits is credit negative, as it will raise borrowing requirements, adding to Ontario's already elevated debt burden. DBRS said, quote, it demonstrates in the clearest terms that the province is not committed to disciplined fiscal policy. What that means is the Liberal government is putting all of Ontario at risk with their reckless spending. Mr. Speaker, is it really worth Question. risking Ontario's future to try and win this election? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today is Equal Pay Day. Hey. And what that means, Mr. Speaker, is that from January until today, basically women in this province have worked free because of the gender wage gap, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this morning I was with the Minister of uh, the Status of Women and we were, uh, we were talking about our investment in uh, free preschool childcare, Mr. Speaker. The number one thing that we can do as government is provide childcare, accessible, high quality, affordable childcare for families, Mr. Speaker. So so that women can get into the workforce. Mr. Speaker, that is economic policy, it is social policy, it is fiscal policy, Mr. Speaker, because having more women involved will mean that the economy will grow. That is why we are making the investments that we are making, Mr. Speaker, to see this economy grow with everyone included. Thank you. Back to the Premier. We're also seeing the harmful effects of this Liberal budget on Ontario's bonds. When Quebec and Ontario offered up their bonds last week, the market told this government what they thought of their budget. The market picked Quebec's bonds, making Ontario's bonds more costly. We are getting a raw deal because this government can't control their spending. As our costs go up, Frontline services are crowded out. We've seen this from the Liberals. Nurses fired and hospital beds closed. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals risking Ontario's future, reducing frontline services just to try to win an election? Oh, I believe deeply that the future of this province depends on its people. That is our advantage. We have people, Mr. Speaker, who are hardworking. They deserve to have the supports that they need to be able to care for themselves and care for their families. When I talk to businesses in other parts of the world, Mr. Speaker, they look to Ontario for a strong, a strong, educated workforce, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we have. Mr. Speaker, if we do not make these investments in people, People. If we do not invest in childcare, in tuition, Mr. Speaker, so that everyone can go to post-secondary, if we do not make sure that people have the supports that they need to be able to thrive, having balanced the budget, Mr. Speaker, is a great accomplishment. Yeah. It is a it is a very important accomplishment. But, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite would yes, have sir. us put the future at risk by not investing in people. We're not going to go down that road, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. 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 Can you see it, please? Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. In a remarkable business turnaround, Quebec and Ontario are literally trading places. Referring to the fact that the market paid a cheaper price for Quebec bonds, Brian Calder of Franklin Bissett said, quote, no way, no how did I ever think we would see Quebec trading through Ontario. He said, quote, simply put, Quebec has been better behaved. Quebec outlined their plan to deliver five consecutive balanced budgets, pay down debt, and lower taxes. In contrast, Ontario will plunge us into six years of deficits, add billions in debt, 
and increase taxes. A decade ago, what was unimaginable is reality in Liberal Ontario. More nurses fired, 100 in my own community. More hospital beds closed, Question. 60 in my own community. Mr. Speaker, do the Liberals really want to put Ontario at greater risk? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, here's the reality. Ontario's debt to GDP outperforms Quebec. Right. Furthermore, Ontario has $30 billion in liquid reserves right now, Mr. Speaker, because investors have oversubscribed on the bonds issues from the province of Ontario, outperforming Quebec. We have more liquidity in our bonds, and it trades well. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, Quebec receives $11 billion from the Federation. Ontario is a net contributor to the Federation. It always has been, even when we qualify for equalization, to the tune of $11 billion, Mr. Speaker. We support all of Canada. We're the engine of Canada, and they are talking down the province of Ontario. Senior, please. Be seated, please. After round one, clearly indicated to me, we're in warnings. We're in warnings. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My new question is for the Premier. Almost a year ago, on May 5, 2017, a Canadian press headline read, quote, Ontario prepared to lower corporate taxes in response to the U.S. Mr. Speaker, it's been almost a year. Will the government lower taxes to help grow and attract businesses? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. We did, Mr. Speaker. We reduced taxes for small business by 22%. Yep. And our corporate income taxes are already the most competitive in North America. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Finish, please. And uh, the United States recognizes that they need to be competitive. And they're trying to catch up to Ontario's rates, Mr. Speaker. Exactly they're laughing again, Mr. Speaker, at the province's prosperity and the growth that we've intended. And we have been the top destination for foreign direct investment for a reason, because we are competitive and will continue to be. And we're going to take the respective actions that's in the budget. Chapter 2 talks all about remaining competitive and, in, and providing supports for businesses to continue to become one of the best provinces and jurisdictions in North America. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. Uh, last, time, or last year at this time, the U.S. was talking about dramatically cutting corporate taxes. Our former economic development minister then said, quote, we'll do whatever we need to do to maintain our competitiveness. A year later, the U.S. did indeed drastically reduce their corporate taxes. And how does the Liberal government respond? They are doing exactly the opposite of what they said they were prepared to do and of what this minister just said. Yes, in the budget, they are raising taxes between personal income tax and new taxes on business. The government is raising your taxes by almost $2 billion. Mr. Speaker, while the U.S. cuts taxes to become competitive, why is Ontario Question. raising our taxes? Thank you. Minister. I'm going to pass on a supplementary to uh, my colleague from Economic Development and Trade. But let's be clear. The member opposite is talking about closure of loopholes, exactly. tax avoidance measures, things that the federal government are doing. And every province then has to emulate some of those practices. But what the member is also saying is, let's cut programs, Mr. Speaker. Member from Niagara South, Glen, uh, Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Finish, please. And the member knows that almost 87% of personal tax filers are not being affected. In fact, 700,000 tax filers are receiving tax cuts. So the member opposite would like to portray 
something that is actually going to continue to harm the very investors that he's speaking of. Ontario has the lowest tax rates and the lowest tax revenues compared to other provinces, including Quebec. We will continue to be competitive. We'll continue to be the leanest yes, government in Canada while providing and safeguarding the programs and services that the people of Ontario Thank rely you. on. Final supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. In the U.S., taxes go down. Here in Ontario, personal income taxes are raised for 1.8 million people have a raise in their personal income tax, and tens of thousands of businesses are also taxed. This is a government that says one thing, Speaker, and does the complete opposite. The minister said, quote, the competitive edge is important to Ontario's economy, and he wants to, quote, assure the business community that the government... Minister, public safety, uh, community safety and correctional services is warned, and I have about four more that I'm waiting for to have one more chirp. Speaker, we lost our competitive edge years ago under this Liberal government, and it is only getting worse. The government has been told they have made Ontario the most expensive jurisdiction in North America in which to do business. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals raising taxes instead of Question. making Ontario more competitive? The members opposite make it abundantly clear that today in Ontario, if you're a Doug Ford conservative, the truth is not your friend or your ally, Speaker. You know, we know, we know with a trumped-up question like the one that just came from the acting leader of the opposition, that they they actually seem to specialize in talking down our province, Speaker. The people of Ontario have every reason to feel hopeful and optimistic about the future, and all of the statistics point in that direction. Lowest unemployment in 17 years, wow. lower than the national average for nearly three consecutive years. We see month over month, week over week job creation. Speaker, on this side of our of this house, we will continue to invest in our people. We will continue to invest in our infrastructure. We will continue to invest in a hopeful and optimistic future for the people of this province because that's what they expect and deserve. And yes, I would caution members opposite. It's most important for us to work together to collaborate to build the province up instead of consistently talking it down. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Hospitals in Ontario are overcrowded and underfunded. Who's responsible for years of frozen hospital budgets and overcrowding? Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party was pleased last year when we uh, increased hospital funding by $500 million, and I'm sure that she will be pleased, and I'm sure, given the question, that she will support uh, the budget, Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. that increases yeah. hospital funding Absolutely. by more than $820 million, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that the health care system has been undergoing a transformation. More people want to be in their homes. There have been billions of dollars that we have invested in home care, Mr. Speaker, and there is more that is needed on that front, but we also recognize that the changes that hospitals have made require that we make a substantial investment this year, as we did last year, uh, in the operations of hospitals, Mr. Speaker, so that people can get health care faster in the hospitals as well as in the community, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. This problem didn't appear out of nowhere, Speaker. It was completely predictable. The Liberals froze and cut hospital budgets. And the result is that people are treated in hallways, shower rooms, bathrooms, waiting rooms, broom closets. Over 30 days from December 15th to January 15th of this year, Trillium Health Partners ran 316 beds in hallways or unconventional spaces. In fact, there were only two nights during that month, during that 30-day period, where someone wasn't in a hallway. Those two days happen to be Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Wow. That means if it wasn't Christmas, people were being treated in a hallway. Who does this Premier think is responsible for that? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment, but I, I just want to say that, um, you know, the people who work in our hospitals deserve our 
utmost support and respect. It is hard work, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have, you know, we have pockets of the province where population is growing, but all over the province, Mr. Speaking, we're seeing an aging demographic that means that there are pressures on our hospital system. Uh, Mr. Speaker, every single budget that we have brought in in this uh, since I've been premier and before has increased the funding to health care, including increasing funding to hospitals. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I recognize that there have been transformations that have happened, meaning that there are more people getting care Answer. in their homes, in community, as they wish. We recognize that there is a need. We have included more than $820 million in Thank this you. budget directly to hospitals. Mr. Final supplementary. Gee, Speaker, I thought the Premier was just going to say that she was sorry that she made such a mess of our hospitals. That's what she should have done. One night, one night in January, Trillium had 193 unfunded beds. From December 15th to January, they had 4,555 unfunded beds. The occupancy rate never once for a single day dipped below 99%. To remind the Premier Speaker, the safe level of occupancy in our hospitals is 85%. This problem didn't just appear out of nowhere. It is the completely predictable result of years and years of cuts and underfunding. Will the Premier own up to a hallway medicine crisis that she has created in our province? Thank you. Health and long-term care. Minister of Health, long-term care. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And here are the facts. Hospital operating funding in Ontario has increased by more than 65 per cent since 2003 wow. to almost $19 billion. In the past two years alone, we've increased operational funding to hospitals by almost $1 billion. So, of course, the investment that we're proposing to make in this year's budget, and I certainly hope, uh, obviously, that we will get support from the third party for our entirely progressive budget this year, we're making an historic investment of an additional $822 million in Ontario's publicly funded hospitals. The types of quotes that we are getting from various hospital CEOs is incredibly impressive. From Eric van der Waal of the Joseph Brandt Hospital, President and CEO, I would like to thank the provincial government for the investment in quality health care. The provincial government's funding announcement for Ontario hospitals is very thank positive you. news for JB. Okay. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Every three minutes, someone in Ontario ends up in a hospital or a doctor's office because their mouth hurts so badly. Last week, I met with Vanessa Giuliano, the Director of Operation Sharing. Operation Sharing helps raise money so families can see a dentist. Because for 15 years, the Liberals have ignored the fact that too many people can't see a dentist. Telling a mom or dad that they have $300 to split between medication and a visit to the dentist isn't going to fix that problem, Speaker. Organizations like Operation Sharing will still have to do their important work. The Liberal scheme will not fix the problem, Speaker. Why not? Thank you. Senior. Mr. Speaker, let me just say that um, you, you know the leader of the third party and I do not disagree that there is a challenge in terms of dental care and pharmacare in this province. I would suggest across the country, Mr. Speaker, because when Medicare was introduced in the 60s, those were two areas that were not covered. And I think if if we can uh, agree on that, then we can agree that if uh, if we were building a Medicare system today, we would include pharmacare and dental care. We would find a way to do that. What we are doing. Here here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is we're taking great steps forward. The OHIP Plus program, Mr. Speaker, will already is covering pre free prescription medication for 4,400 <coughs> medications for kids from their birth until their 25th birthday. And we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that we need to expand that. So next year, seniors will have free prescription medication. And, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that everyone in between needs some support Answer. as well. And that's what the dental and pharma plan is about, Mr. Speaker. And I'll speak more about that in the supplement. Thank you. Cindy Blair and her 17-year-old son live in Cambridge. Cindy works three jobs, and none of them have benef benefits. Fifty bucks is not going to get her son's teeth looked after, Speaker. It wouldn't pay for half a filling. 
The PCs don't have a plan except for over $6.1 billion in cuts. Under my plan, Cindy could look her son in the eye and say it's going to be okay. 50 bucks is not enough for children's dental, Speaker. Why doesn't this Premier care? Sure, I do care, and in fact, um, you know, if it's a, a mom and one child, we're talking about $450, Mr. Speaker. If you're talking about a family, uh, uh, two adults and two children, Mr. Speaker, you're talking about $700, and that $700 can be used, Mr. <coughs> Speaker, to offset costs. Whether it's pharma costs or whether it's dental costs, they can be used to offset those costs. But, Mr. Speaker, if it's pharma costs and if it's a child, that child is all, will already have their, exactly. their prescription medications co covered, Mr. Speaker, all 4,400. According to the NDP's pharma plan, Mr. Speaker, and I know that, uh, that the third party is putting forward their plan, but under the NDP's pharma plan, Mr. Speaker, people with certain allergies would have to pay for drugs, there'd be a lack of choice for mental health drugs. Women would lose choice on the contraceptives they choose to take, Mr. Oh. Speaker. There would be less coverage for therapies like yes, for conditions like cystic fibrosis or Crohn's or colitis. So, Mr. Speaker, I am not going to take lessons from the leader of the third party on how to put an, an uniform. Thank you. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, here's a lesson for the Premier. Families that can't afford dental care don't have 700 bucks up front to pay to then get it refunded by this Premier's inadequate plan. This Premier is completely out of touch with the families of Ontario. Her plan is completely inadequate, and everybody knows it, Speaker. Here's a, here's a story about Steve. I met Steve in Oshawa. Steve is 60 years old, and he is able and ready to retire. His 80-factor his plan has kicked in. He's ready to go, but he can't retire. He can't retire because he needs $21,000 in diabetes medication, and he doesn't have that $100,000 in his pocket that he's going to need over the next five years to pay for his diabetes medication. He needs pharmacare, and he needs it today. The Premier thinks he should wait five more years, Speaker. Doug Ford probably thinks Steve shouldn't have any pharmacare whatsoever. Question. Can the Premier explain to Steve why she doesn't care that Steve has to postpone retirement for five years now because he needs a prescription drug? Thank you. Premier. <laughs> Well, I can certainly agree with the leader of the third party on what uh, what the Conservatives might think about this, but, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party does not have the corner on caring, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that the budget that we have brought in, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely focused on providing those supports for people so that they can care for themselves and care for their families. Look, I do not disagree with the leader of the third party that we need to have a comprehensive national pharma care plan and that everyone needs to be covered by that, Mr. Speaker. I agree with her on that, which is exactly why for years the Minister of Health in this province has been advocating at the table with the other Ministers of Health is exactly why I have been advocating with my fellow Premiers that we need a national pharma Pharma care plan, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We've been very clear about that. So there's no disagreement here. The only disagreement is that we've moved forward and put the OHIP Plus plan in place, and we're going to continue to move forward. We've made the biggest expansion of Medicare in a generation, and we're going to keep going. Thank you. Your question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the Premier. Last fall, I called on the Premier to condemn the federal Liberals' massively unpopular tax hikes on small business, but she refused. Well, the 2018 budget from her government shed new light on why she wouldn't stand up for Ontario's small businesses, and it's because she had plans to pile on. Speaker, the Ontario government announced in their budget that they will put 20,000 employers on the hook for $100 million more in employment health tax over the next three years. Some businesses will also be phased out of the small business deduction, resulting in an additional $350 million in new taxes in the same time frame. Speaker, why is this government taxing away the jobs of the hardworking people of Ontario? Here, here. So let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is talking about uh, tax loopholes that the federal government is trying to close. And we actually are targeting uh, the employer health tax to benefit 
more businesses. Many more businesses are actually going to see benefits as a result of the measures that we've taken in this budget. But the member opposite is saying, yeah, but those companies that are big umbrellas and they're big conglomerates, they subdivide themselves into little pieces so they then skirt the ability to pay employer health tax for their employees and for the benefit of Ontarians. They say that's okay. The federal government is closing those loopholes. All provinces are being aligned with it. The member opposite may want to make tax cuts so they can support even further taxing and cutting of programs. That's up to them. But in the end, they're going to have a huge hole to fill. We want to protect the people of Ontario. That's we want to protect our universal health program to ensure that's well funded. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. These tax changes are new salt in the wound for small businesses and job creators already struggling to cope with dramatic labour reforms, the minimum wage hike, high energy costs, and increasing pressure from international competition. Speaker, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce has been clear that these, cha that these changes will hurt our local businesses. Chamber President Rocco Rossi has a message for this government, and I quote, we need government to reduce the burden, not add to it. Yeah. Our economy depends on small businesses. Speaker, why do the Liberals continue to punish small business <coughs> in Ontario by raising taxes? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. So let's be clear. Once again, many small businesses are going to benefit from the targeting of these effects. Exactly. They'll be uh, targeted to EHT to provide greater exemptions for those small businesses. Some are taking undue advantage of that loophole. That's what's being closed. And it's not small businesses that are doing it, Mr. Speaker. It's big businesses that aren't paying their fair share. It's a matter of equity. It's a matter of being transparent. It's about being simplistic in terms of the way it's being created. That's all that's being done, Mr. Speaker. We've increased the R&D tax credits. We provided for increasing the innovation tax credits. We reduced taxes for small business by 22 percent. We're providing apprenticeship programs up to $17,000 for individuals in those sectors. We're allowing $2,000 for every new employee that's a youth. Mr. Speaker, they're voting against those very measures that will ultimately benefit small yes, business. Sir. We will continue to help small business, here, Mr. Here. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today is Equal Pay Day, and women across Ontario are wearing red to signify how far into the next year a woman must work to earn what men earned the previous year. Speaker, in 15 years under this Liberal government, the 30 per cent gender wage gap has barely budged. Today, the actions that are finally being taken to close the gap are more symbolic than real. Half measures, like a child care plan that ignores the needs of women who require infant care. And at the same time, this government is engaged in a lengthy legal battle at the Human Rights Tribunal to oppose women like midwives who are fighting for equal pay. Will the Premier show some leadership, do the right thing, and settle these human rights cases? You see it, please? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I remarked earlier in question period that it's uh, Equal Pay Day, and this is a uh, this is a uh, a really intractable issue that uh, that governments have been dealing with for uh, many years, Mr. Speaker. It was a it was a Liberal government in 1987 that introduced pay equity legislation, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that there is more that we have to do. And so, um, it is. It is not coincidental, Mr. Speaker, that the number one recommendation of the group that we asked to give us advice on the gender wage gap, the number one recommendation was to provide child care, affordable, high-quality child care. The leader of the third party is warned. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, the, the bulge of children and families who are looking for, uh, for childcare is at two and a half years. That is exactly why the plan that we are introducing starts at two and a half years to four years, Mr. Speaker. And you know, that builds on the full day kindergarten that yeah. is already in place in this province that saves, that is wonderful for kids, gives them a great start, but also saves families $6,000 a Answer. year per child. So, Mr. Speaker, we're taking a great step forward. And it is about those kids and it is about those families and those women who want to get back into Thank the you. workforce. Supplementary. Again to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier knows that frontline workers in the community and social services sector are overwhelmingly female. These workers deliver important public services to Ontarians in nursing homes, in developmental services, and other community agencies. But they typically earn $3 to $8 an hour less than their comparators in hospitals and municipalities. These workers have been waiting decades to achieve pay equity. It didn't happen when the Conservatives were in government, and it certainly hasn't happened under 15 years of Liberal government. Will the Premier show women the money? Will she agree to fund pay equity wages for the women who work in community and social services agencies? You no, know, Mr. Speaker. Uh... You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I stood in the uh, gym at St. Helen Catholic School with the uh, MPP for um, Davenport and the Minister of the Status of Women, well, you know, the, the, the member for Renfrew talks about a photo op. It was an unusual photo op, Mr. Speaker. It was five women yeah, standing on a stage making a very significant amount announcement about child care and about uh, gender, closing the gender wage gap in this province. I'll be the first to say, Mr. Speaker, that it should have happened 25 years ago, should have happened 30 years ago, Mr. Speaker. We should be farther along. We should have closed the gender wage gap, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The member from Renfrew and Ipissing Pembroke is warned. Someone else was close. To this office as Premier, Mr. Speaker, we immediately put increases into uh, early childhood educators, developmental so support workers, yeah. and um, personal support workers, Mr. Speaker, because they were at the bottom of the uh, of the wages, and we knew that that was important. We made that increase, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We're introducing a pay grid as part of the uh, the child care changes, Mr. Speaker. I know the best time to have done this would have been 50 years Thank ago. You. The second best time is today, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, today we recognize Equal Pay Day in Ontario and across Canada. Today serves as a symbolic reminder of the extra time each year that it takes a woman, on average, to earn as much as a man. We are recognizing the pay gap that still exists between men and women and the work that still remains to close that gap. It reminds us of the work that remains to be done. It is 2018, and it should not take 15 and a half months for a woman to make the same as a man did in just 12 months. The women of our province deserve better. Minister, can you please tell us on Equal Pay Day what you have done to close the gender, gender wage gap. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Barrie for what is a very, very uh, important question on Equal Pay Day. I'm, I'm proud to speak about the government's strong commitment and the work we've done on the gender wage gap, Speaker. We began this process about four years ago. We brought together representatives from equality advocacy groups, labour organisations, HR professionals, business, and we formed the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee. I Good. believe we may Good even idea. have a few members of that committee here with us in the House today, Speaker. And I'd like to thank them for the positive work that they've been able to do to advance us. Great. They went around the province, they held extensive consultations, and they developed a report that gave us some great recommendations. Here, here. We took immediate action on immediate. some of those recommendations. Then we brought together a similar group to talk about the implementation speaker. And they discussed the steering committee's report, and they provided very practical input. Based on their expert advice, Answer. speaker, we've taken some very, very concrete steps that are before the House 
today that need to get through this House to be put into action. Speaker. Right. Supplementary Council. Thank you, Minister. When I look around the legislature, I'm very proud to see so many women working hard for their communities and for all the people of Ontario. We know that while women are present in all industries and sectors, there are still barriers that remain to prevent their full participation in the workforce. Most notably, women continue to earn 30 per cent less on average than men. That gap is larger for racialized women and even larger for women with disabilities. This is unacceptable. It is time to close the gender wage gap. It's time for a comprehensive plan that recognizes women's economic empowerment isn't a quick fix, and it isn't one-size-fits-all. We know that increasing women's economic participation is the right thing to do for the sake of equality and for the good of our economy. Question. Minister, what steps are you taking to close the gender wage gap right now? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the supplementary. Speaker, we've invested in childcare, we've invested in health care, we've raised the minimum wage, we've brought in measures such as equal pay for work of equal value, equal pay for equal work. We know there's more to be done, Speaker. We've introduced, and I said it's in the House today, the pay, tra uh, pay transparency legislation. Mm -hmm. We're the very first jurisdiction in all of Canada to introduce a comprehensive package of measures that are going to increase pay transparency and workforce competition. Uh, composition aggregated data speaker. The legislation is going to be a new tool in our toolkit that's going to promote workplace equity. It's going to help put some sunlight, speaker, shine a light on pay inequities and biases that already exist, speaker. It's not clear where the official opposition stands on, the, on this issue, speaker. It's disappointing, it's surprising. Speaker, women's economic equality should not be a partisan Thank issue. You. The best day is to date. Thank you. New question, the Minister of London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, a few weeks ago, it was brought to my attention that mobili mobility fit physiotherapy located in St. Thomas will no longer be taking clients. When I contacted both the Land and the Ministry of Health on whether they knew of the fact of this closing. I received the same set of talking points. Both were unable to confirm if the clinic was closing. Speaker, this uh, runs contradictory to both a Facebook post and voicemail from the clinic itself indicating they are no longer taking on clients. My question for the minister, are both the ministry and the Lynn unaware of the closing of mobility fit, or are they knowingly letting this potential gap to be created in Elgin County? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we know that providing patients with access to physiotherapy helps them to stay healthy and to stay at home longer where they want to be. And so, this is why, of course, uh, across the province, we do have a very comprehensive program for community and primary care physiotherapy. We introduced this five years ago, part of our ongoing commitment to improve our health care system over the time that we've been in government. And so, uh, uh, from time to time, we know that there are changes. I believe this clinic is a private clinic. Uh, and of course, we expect our Lynn in the Southwest to be working very closely uh, with this clinic so we can ensure that uh, patient care is provided uh, where it is needed and when it is needed uh, in a timely fashion. And we'll continue to work in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to uh, the minister. The closure of mobility fit physiotherapy and a complete lack of action on the part of both the ministry and the Lynn is going to have devastating consequences for the people in Elgin County and St. Thomas. This closure leaves only one clinic to serve a large population for my constituents. If the government continues to ignore this issue, wait times will continue to climb and many will go without proper treatment. I already have the orthopedic surgeons on red alert knowing that this clinic will not be available to them. It's unfair for this government in the Southwest Lynn to expect my constituents, especially those who have just undergone surgery, to travel to London to search for treatment. They should not be treated as second-class citizens in this province. My question to the minister, what is the ministry doing today to ensure there is OHIP covered physiotherapy in my riding for all the residents of Elgin St. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
the Lynn has informed us that there is actually no indication that uh, this particular clinic is closing. There's rumor and innuendo uh, apparently out there in the community. Um, obviously, our Lynn is going to be working closely with the clinic to look at uh, the particular circumstances in this case. Our goal is always to ensure that people receive the appropriate uh, health care that they need, including physiotherapy. Uh, clearly, it's very important post-surgery that this be available, and uh, we will continue to work in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, each year, thousands of people are seriously injured or killed while using our roads. One of those people is a cyclist named Anthony Smith. While Anthony was cycling in Barrie this past October, the driver of a pickup truck suddenly swerved left across his path, and Anthony became trapped under the truck. Anthony's spine was fractured. He has undergone two surgeries. He has spent weeks in the hospital. He has gone to nearly 100 medical appointments. The driver of the pickup truck was only charged with hiding his license plate. He received a $125 fine. Why is it acceptable in Ontario that a driver who seriously injures a vulnerable road user, a pedestrian or cyclist like Anthony, only receives a $125 Question. fine? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined uh, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo this morning for sharing the stories during the media studio. As a former trauma, trauma ER nurse, I very much can relate to having to manage not only the victims who came in from accidents and collisions on the road, but also the families. I had to make some of those calls and sit and uh, care for the families afterwards. So nothing's more important to me as Minister of Transportation than road safety. So this past fall, our government announced our bold plan to keep our most vulnerable road users safe. It came in direct response to what we heard from road safety advocates, but also those who have been personally impacted by the loss of a loved one or a friend on our roads. In particular, I want to reference the President of the Treasury Board, who has been one of the strongest advocates for changing our laws for careless driving. So the new charge of careless driving causing death or bodily harm comes up Thank to you. a $50,000. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. And again to the Premier. Thousands of vulnerable road users like Anthony or Heather or Meredith or Margaret or Jessica or Albert are put in danger every year because Ontario's laws do not hold drivers accountable when they seriously injure or kill. A driver can kill or seriously injure a cyclist or pedestrian, and most of the time, the driver will likely just receive a fine of maybe a few hundred dollars. They do not lose their license, they are not required to take driver training, and they do not even get need to attend court to hear the victim impact statement and face the consequences of their actions. Does the Premier agree that drivers should face meaningful consequences when they seriously injure or kill and if she does believe this, Question. why hasn't her government passed a vulnerable road user law like the one that was tabled in October? I stand, you sit. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Indirect answer. We passed it last spring. And it's a new charge of careless driving causing death or bodily harm. It comes with, up with a $50,000 penalty and up to two years imprisonment and a license suspension for up to five years, making this the toughest penalty in this Highway Traffic Act. It's amongst some of the toughest penalties in Canada. Ontario was the first in Canada to introduce the penalties. It has yet to be enacted. They're continuing to do the work to do that, but we passed that law last spring. So we continue to ensure that the new charge provides the law enforcement. <laughs> Wrap up sentence, please. 
Thank you. Let me be clear. That's a penalty that was not previously available to our enforcement officers who have been asking for this. This new charge provides them with that strong tool and one that enforcement officers have Thank asked you. to respond to for many years. Thank you. New question, the member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, my question is on cap and trade, or as some may have called it, cap and invest. But in addition to asking about specific details, I'd like to know specifically from the minister, does he have a written plan, and are its many details too long and too elaborate to fit on a bumper sticker or a label? Speaker, we know that climate change is one of the most serious problems we face today, both globally and here in Ontario. Broad consensus, of course, exists that the best way to deal with climate change is to put a price on pollution. In Ontario, our cap on pollution for businesses guarantees reductions in pollution, and it does so at the cheapest price possible for Ontario businesses and residents. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how this government is continuing to take action on climate change by putting a price on carbon? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the uh, member from Etobicoke North for a very important question. And yes, I can assure him that that Ontario has a very comprehensive plan to fight uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Our climate change action plan has some 90 plus points. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't fit it on a bumper sticker, uh, Mr. Speaker, but it is exceptionally detailed. I want to say that. Uh, uh, that uh, we are we are proud here in Ontario to be recognized as a leader in the global fight against climate change uh, and the medical doctor from uh, Etobicoke North knows this he knows as well speaker that a report released yesterday by the Clean Economy Alliance said and let me quote Ontario is a leading jurisdiction when it comes to efforts to fight climate change that report speaker that report also noted th that since 2005 Carbon emissions in Ontario are down by 20 per cent. We've done things, Premier. We've taken real leadership. We've done things like shutting down dirty coal-fired plants. Uh, we've introduced our cap on pollution. Thank you. And we've achieved significant improvements. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the Minister's uh, reassurance of having a full and detailed, elaborate climate change plan, unlike the party opposite, which to my mind, Speaker, is running on empty. <laughs> Speaker, no plan, no juice, just pitches and one-liners. Speaker, while the opposition seems to be supporting the current U.S. president and looking forward to trumping Ontario, we, of course, welcomed former Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, just very recently. And Speaker, do you know what he said about Ontario? He said that when he travels to other parts of the world, he points to our province and our premier when he talks about climate leadership and action. When leaders of governments across the world ask him where to look for models, responsible leadership and action, he says, I always point to Ontario. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister, first of yes, all, sir. will he answer this question and will he also present himself for questioning and scrutiny, or will he prefer to hide from the press and Thank not you. come out of the basement? <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, uh, I'm, 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 I'm delighted that the uh, member from Etobicoke North talked about basements because I can tell you that here in Ontario, one of the serious repercussions of climate change is flooding flooding in our basements. You have to look to uh, Windsor, you have to look to Burlington, you have to look to Toronto. Multiple basements across the province where people see, Ontarians see firsthand the price they're paying for climate change. The average $45,000 to $50,000 per cleanup in those basements, Mr. Speaker. So I am delighted to be transparent and open and talk about what this province is doing when it comes to climate change. Uh, and uh, I will say right now that protecting Ontario's basements by fighting climate change is at the top of what we're doing. You know, I am I'll let the first one go, not this time. The member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington is warned. <coughs> Wrap up sentence, please. You know, Speaker, 
We're appalled to see that the PCs are refusing to take any action on climate change, and I know Ontarians will hold them accountable. Thank you. The question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Minister is aware that Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare is considering the futures of the Huntsville District Memorial Hospital and South Muskoka Memorial Hospital. Just last week, MAHC's task force released descriptions of the three models they are considering, saying they will be making a recommendation this spring. The three options they are considering are two acute sites maintaining the existing hospitals and services, one inpatient and one outpatient site, and a one-site model. Speaker, the people of Muskoka and Almaguin have been very clear. They want their two hospitals maintained. Will the minister encourage MAHC and the task force to listen to the people who rely upon these hospitals and recommend maintaining two hospitals? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Care. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the member opposite is uh, obviously a well-known advocate for his community, and uh, we've heard from the Muskoka Algonquin CEO on a number of issues uh, in relation to plans for the future. I uh, really do want to commend the way the Ontario Hospital Association has stepped up to the plate uh, in assisting us at looking how we move forward with looking at efficiencies, centres of excellence, and yet providing care as close to home as possible. All these pieces are very much in the mix. And it's uh, really quite remarkable how our advisory council, uh, chaired by the Ontario Hospital Association president, has looked at the whole spectrum of hospitals in this province, from academic health science centres, psychiatric hospitals, rehab Answer. hospitals, all the services that are provided through small hospitals, large hospitals, etc. And I'll have more to say in the supplement. Thank you. Supplements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health. One of the challenges facing Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare and other small and medium-sized hospitals is that their funding has not kept up with their costs. Exactly. Many of these costs are not things the hospitals can control. And in fact, some, like hydro costs and collective bargaining agreements, are things the province controls. Yes. So the province has increased hospital costs without increasing funding to cover these costs. As a result, some hospitals have run deficits for many years. In the lead-up to the June election, the government has been touting the 4.6 per cent increase they are supposedly giving to Ontario's hospitals. But MHAC received only 1.4 per cent, and West Perry Sound Health Centre has been told they will receive approximately 1 per cent. Speaker, will the minister explain why these hospitals, in my riding, are not receiving the full 4.6 per cent increase Question. in funding? Yep. Well, Mr. Speaker, we made it very clear that our increase, the $822 million this year, would provide an average of 4.6 per cent overall increase to hospitals in this province. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, in some uh, communities, high-growth communities, such as ones that I represent, uh, the need, the, inc uh, the increase in population, the increase in acuity is greater than in some other areas of the province. This is precisely why we consult with the Ontario Hospital Association, as well as the local, local health integration network, as to the distribution of these funds. It's based on evidence. It's based on need. In particular, in this situation, I I know that my predecessor, the former Minister of Health, met with the City Council uh, and asked them to come back with a unified plan for the hospitals in uh, the members' riding. And so we look forward to that. We're awaiting that kind of uh, community decision Answer. to inform us, and we'll move forward in that regard. Here. Thank you. Question, the member from Welland. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, 3,000. And yes, I said 3,000 York University contract faculty, teaching assistants, and other part time academic workers are still on the picket line this morning. They're continuing to take a stand against insecure academic jobs that have become pervasive throughout the sector. The underfunding of post secondary education that caused this will be one of the legacies of the Liberal government. 
The recent changes to labour laws under Bill 148 did nothing to change that fact. These workers want to get back to the important work that they do, supporting students. Um, the member from London West already and recently has raised these issues with the Premier in the House, as have many of my colleagues. Will the Premier show some leadership today, ask the publicly funded administration of York University to quit stalling and get back to the bargaining table? Thank you. Perfect. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. And uh, on this side of the house, we want to see our students back in the classroom as soon as possible. And we are urging the best path to that resolution is at the bargaining table. So we are urging both sides, Speaker, to get back to the bargaining table. There might require some compromise on both sides in order to do that. But we have to keep the interests of the students first in this uh, situation, Speaker. And uh, I know that um, there has been support from the Ministry of Labour all the way through this process, and we're strongly urging both sides to do that right thing, get back to the bargaining table, start talking to each other, and yes, it might require compromise on both sides, but this is all about the best interests of our students, and we want to see them getting back to the classroom so that they can resume their studies without interruption as quickly as possible. Speaker. Well, Speaker, this is not unique, actually, to York University. We know that recently Carleton was out on, strike, out on strike. So for 10 years, since 2008, 2009, Ontario has had the lowest of all provinces of university funding per student. This downloads the costs onto the students, onto their families, creating record student debt and led to the explosion of precarious contract work. Students know what the problem is. The contract part-time precarious faculty know what the problem is. New Democrats know what the problem is. My question, Speaker, does the Premier? Minister. So, Speaker, I, I want to say that um, the situation at Carleton has been successfully resolved. Uh, there was a settlement at the table that was voted on and ratified by the members. Um, that is the collective bargaining process, and, uh, and we can see where it has worked. That is what we want to see with respect to the situation at York. We want both sides to come together with a focus on a resolution so that we can prioritize the needs of students and they can resume their studies. You know, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite talked about funding for post-secondary education. And I want to say no government in the history of this province, under the leadership of this premier, has funded post-secondary education for students uh, as it relates to the new OSAP program. Absolutely. 235,000 wow. students are now attending wow. post-secondary education yeah, yeah. Wow. for free, tuition paid, because of this program. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Access has increased. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Mr. Speaker, as you know, today is Equal Pay Day, and it was my pleasure to welcome the Premier, Minister Malley, to my riding of Davenport this morning to mark this day. My question is for the Minister of Status. That women. comes first. Today is a day to reflect on the value of equal pay for all workers in our province. It is a day where we measure just how much more men are paid for the same work as women. In Ontario, we know that the gender wage gap sits at about 30 percent, and we know that this pay gap is even greater for racialized, Indigenous, LGBT, LGBTQ plus women, women living with disabilities, and newcomer women. Equal Pay Day acknowledges the work we still have to do, work that will create a better future for young women and girls. Women in Ontario continue to face challenges and barriers to achieve full economic participation. Can the minister please tell this House how the government is helping to close the gender wage gap and ensure women are given equal opportunity for access? Thank you. Minister Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question, and I'm very pleased to rise today in the Legislature to recognize April 10th as Equal Pay Day in Ontario. Speaker, the gender wage gap is real, and for far too many women in this province are being held back in the workplace, passed up for leadership roles, and are working multiple jobs to make ends meet. But we are all working to change that. Last summer, my ministry consulted province-wide to create Then, Now, Next, Ontario's strategy for women's economic empowerment. Working with my colleague, the Minister of Labour, we have introduced historic pay transparency legislation because women deserve the tools to negotiate for a fair wage. 
We are leveraging the government's buying power to encourage large firms to meet a 30 per cent target of women on their boards, and it is clear that child care remains it is clear that childcare remains a significant Answer. barrier to women's full economic participation. In fact, our Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee's top recommendation was to invest in childcare, and we have 100,000 new childcare Thank spaces. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and again to the Minister of Status of Women. The government plans to increase pay transparency and empower women to bargain for a fair wage, and we are introducing historic legislation that would require employers to disclose pay rates and pay scales for publicly posted positions. But, Speaker, the reality is 58 per cent of minimum wage earners are women. Many women find it difficult to find meaningful, well-paying jobs. We must support women who are entering the workforce for the first time or returning after an absence. Speaker, my question is, what are we doing for those women? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Then now next, Ontario's strategy of women's economic empowerment is a multi-ministry strategy that will ensure that every woman in Ontario can access their full potential in the economy at all income levels. Our government is empowering women, workers and leaders by expanding women's centres so that they can provide much-needed support to women rebuilding their lives, including those living with violence, and enforcing Get On Board, Ontario's implementation plan to promote women in corporate leadership because increasing the number of women on private and public boards is a step in the right direction. We are removing barriers to Indigenous women's leadership through targeted programming and developed with our Indigenous partners. And we're investing in mentorship and networking for women who face higher barriers like racialized women. We are also establishing Sir. an Ontario's Women Entrepreneurship Association to increase women's access to opportunity and to scale up and expand ventures. Women deserve action, and we are delivering Thank a bold government approach. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, construction of the WPD wind project on the south shore of Prince Edward County is creating havoc for local residents. Road issues, noise issues, and other problems are a daily occurrence as construction is underway, in spite of the fact that the municipality wants no part of this wind project. Your government insists, though, on pushing ahead with a project that's actually going to cost electricity customers over $100 million in the future on their bills. So, Speaker, how much of Prince Edward County is this government willing to tear up to accommodate this unnecessary wind project? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I do want to thank the member for the question, and I know he's actively involved in this project, and uh, he and I talk about it often. Um, the one thing that we try to do, Mr. Speaker, and, and the last procurement through our LRP process, we really worked hard, Mr. Speaker, at trying to strike that right balance between early community engagement uh, and achieving value for ratepayers by putting an emphasis uh, on, on the cost, Mr. Speaker. And now, it also is important to note that all LRP projects, Mr. Speaker, are administered um, by the uh, independent electricity system operator, and it's overseen, uh, Mr. Speaker, through that process uh, by an external fairness advisor. And, and when that contract is offered, Mr. Speaker, the, the project, uh, we need to make Sir. sure that they know, Mr. Speaker, that the project isn't over. Project developers then must obtain all required licenses and approvals, such as renewable energy approval. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, yes, very right. much. Speaker, I just want to remind the minister that this has been a very controversial project in Prince Edward County. It started off as a 29 wind turbine project, and by the government's own environmental review tribunal, was reduced down to nine turbines. How in the world is this even economically viable, given the fact that the Environmental Review Tribunal, for environmental reasons, has decided that 20 of these turbines need to be eliminated? The latest update on the active contract generation page for the independent electricity system operator shows that the WPD project hasn't been given notice to proceed, Speaker, but the latest update was three months ago. Is the government trying to get this expensive unneeded wind project, and I know the minister knows that. Question. Are they trying to get this completed before the election, and are they, have they given notice to proceed to WPD? 
Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the honourable member is is very, very active in this file, so he should know, Mr. Speaker, that it is the ISO and this external fairness advisor that are the ones that are administering this contract, Mr. Speaker. So, if he wants the clarification on that, Mr. Speaker, he can easily contact the ISO and talk to them about it as well, Mr. Speaker. When we're looking at what we're doing on this side of the house, making sure that we're investing in renewable energy, investing in sustainable energy, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it is this government that is creating jobs and creating an affordable electricity and clean electricity system right across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. President of Treasury Board on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, proud to welcome to the uh, Legislative Assembly today uh, staff from the great city of Burlington joining us in the public gallery. Jennifer Knight, Colleen Black, Janet Bo Bogusklowski, Muriel Browers, Anne-Marie Cumber, Wendy Garside, Debbie Hordick, Carmela Marchesen, Tracy O'Neill, Amanda Ridgeway, Patty Sullivan, Tara Thorpe, Kwab Ako Ajay, and Helen Wallahura. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. On a point of order. Uh, thank you. I'd like to correct my uh, record speaker. I said that the legislation that contains the new charge of careless driving, causing death or bodily harm, was passed last spring. It was, in fact, passed uh, December 12, 2017. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. All members have a right to correct their record. I thank you for that. The member from uh, Windsor Tecumseh is warned. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, just, I just thought it out for you that. No, I. <clears throat> Hansard, do not record that. <laughs> there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.